Batteries are very important. So I have uh, been Zooming, emailing, and visiting with several of you as you're working to complete homework one. Um, most of you, I'm happy to say, have it done, so you can feel good about that. Um, those of you who don't get to feel good about that just yet, please let me help you. If you're still struggling to figure out how to import your data, if you're not sure how to work with these programs, um, the reality is that this is probably a completely different skill set than the ones that you've already developed. It's like learning a new language, it's learning a different way of interacting with the computer, and those things can combine to make it somewhat frustrating. So please let me help you. Um, you know they pay me, right? <laughs> like they pay me to do this job. I know, I'm so lucky. Um, so just remember that whenever you think that you're bothering me or you don't want to take up my time, they pay me. This is literally my job and I'm happy to help you. Um, uh, I think most of you found that once you actually figured out how to make SAS spit out numbers, everything went pretty good from that point, SAS or STATA, I should say. Um, are there any questions about the actual homework problems themselves? No. Okay. Um, let me know if you do come across anything. It's not due until tomorrow night, so you've still got some time to work on it. Um, odds are good the next homework is going to get pushed similarly to the Wednesday of that week because we're about one day behind relative to when I initially put the schedule together. I will let you know um, by Thursday what, what that, that's going to happen. Um, otherwise, we could start talking about something new today. Ooh. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe new, maybe not new. If you've taken any sort of intro stats before, you probably have heard a lot of what I have to say, but it's never a bad thing to review. So let's, uh, let's talk about this. Uh, first off, I want to revisit the cliffhanger that I left you with uh, maybe two weeks ago, the, the Diet Mountain Dew example. How many ounces are supposed to be in this can? You remember? Twelve. Twelve. The same as in the baby bottles, even though they, they seem very tiny to me. If I went to the trouble to measure one of my cans and found that it came up short, how do I know whether or not that's an anomaly or whether there is something more insidious going on, caffeine deprivation as a, a conspiracy? So this was the example that uh, we were playing with before. Let's say that I went to the trouble to measure every can in a pack of soda and the mean of the pack came out to be 11.8 ounces instead. Suspicious. But the question is, how much variability is there around that mean? How precise is it? And that is characterized by the standard deviation. So I can calculate the average offness, so to speak, of each can from the mean. And if that number, for instance, were 0.3, then that would be, on average, it's off either low, meaning 11.5 ounces instead, or high, 12.1. If I only had, say, a six-pack of baby bottles, those two numbers together create this thing right here, which is the standard error of the mean. So the difference between what standard deviation means and what standard error means. Do you remember this? Do you want to hear about it again? Yeah, want to hear about it again? Because they sound like the same thing, don't they? They're not. Yes, it's, it's a different level of abstraction. What we are trying to do is even though we only have one, let's make this a 12 pack since we're talking cans today, we have one 12 pack and we are trying to use just that one 12 pack to make an inference about the population of all possible 12 packs of soda. Now that's a stretch, but that's what we're doing. So this number right here is the standard error. The formula for it is right there, it's the st standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. The standard error tells us the average deviation of the sample mean from the population mean. So it's the fluctuation of the pack means. That's standard error. Whereas standard deviation is the fluctuation of the cans within the pack. So it's, standard deviation is like a local <laughs> estimate of dispersion. Standard error is trying to then use that information to guess how wiggly, how dis discrepant the population, the sample means would be around the population mean. And the standard error is smaller. That means we have more precision. There's less wiggle of any given pack mean around the population mean. And if you want your standard error to be smaller, what do you need? 
they have more people or more, more cans, right? So if I did a 24 pack instead, you can see that that number shrinks. And what else? More people. Smaller standard error. Smaller standard error. So they work backwards from each other. So what is the smallest that a standard deviation could possibly be? Zero. Yeah. If, and if you're working in a factory that has perfect reliability of the process, then that goes to zero, that goes to zero. If there's no difference between the cans, then the exact same pack mean should be observed in all the packs, right? But to the extent that the cans differ, that means the pack means are going to differ. And that means that we don't know for sure what any given sample mean would give us. So if I have this information, how do I know if this 11.8 is suspicious relative to the 12? That's where we left off. Turns out there's an app for that. Within Excel, but more importantly, within SAS and Stata, so you can learn how to answer that question. So that's where we left off. So thoughts, questions, comments? No, we're good so far? Okay, continue chewing or nodding, as it were. That's fine. So this example is convenient because the numbers are inherently meaningful. We have ounces of caffeine here, right? And so you know what 12 ounces looks like. You know what 8 ounces look like. But not all variables, particularly in the social sciences, where we're making up constructs like um, efficacy or depression or leadership ability, right? These things that are sort of fuzzy, they have scales that are not always inherently meaningful. So if uh, my son comes home and he tells me, I got a six on my test today, mommy, uh, I'm sorry or congratulations. Like, <laughs> I had no idea. Now, if he's happy to tell me about this, I can probably infer that it was a good score. But what are the other questions I might want to ask to try and get a sense of what does six mean? Out of how many? Yeah, out of how many. That's a good one. <laughs> um, what if he says that the pos number possible was 20? Why is he so excited if he got a six out of 20? What did everybody else get, right? <laughs> Maybe everybody else had an average of four, and he got a six, and so he's happy about that, right? Everything is relative. So we, one of the first things that um, we'll talk about today is this idea of taking a scale that's somewhat arbitrary and transforming it into something that's more meaningful. And it turns out that the same type of idea applies at the higher level of abs abstraction when we're talking about sampling distributions around our statistics as well as just statistics from the data that we have. So let's give it a shot. We're going to pick up here with lecture two. Um, I fuss with my lectures incessantly, like they're never really done. So every now and again you'll see like a different word or something that I've added. I'll try to remind you if the thing you've printed will look different, but just so you know that I'm, I'm sort of a perfectionist that way. Um, where is slideshow? Let's do that. Play from the beginning, why not? And we'll move the, the zoomers over here for a moment. No, come on, we can do it. There we go. Now I can see it. And come on. There we go. So, transforming variables. Have you heard about this kind of thing before? Maybe? D definite nod? The idea is that there's two different kinds of ways that you can change the scale of a variable. One of the ways maintains the integrity of the variable, it just changes the scale, and the other does not. The kind that maintains is what's known as a linear transformation. So you can shift the mean, you can shift the standard deviation, and the relative distances between the numbers still hold. So for instance, one of the things that we will do to predictors when we start building models is what's known as centering. Centering is the process of subtracting a constant so that zero is within the scale of the new predictor. Um, that's necessary to make sure that the rest of the model parameters have interpretations that actually make sense. But it would look something like this. Let's say that I have a variable with a mean of five and a standard deviation of four. If I take that column and I subtract 5 from it, make a new column, then everything is just shifted over 5. 
I haven't changed anything about the variable. I've just made five the new zero. And that's convenient for interpretation for variables that can't possibly go down to zero. Okay, with me so far? The other kind, um, nonlinear transformations. Uh, here's a very common thing that you will see, a log transformation. Um, I actually had to look this up on Wikipedia to say it correctly. So if you're thinking, I remember logs, but not really, I'm right there with you. It is, uh, the logarithm is the exponent to which the base must be raised to produce a number x. Um, there are different kinds of bases, bases that people use. It's always natural log and statistics. You will rarely see anything else. But a log transformation is often used to take data that have positive skew and sort of reel in that tail. So we have a variable that looks like this on the right. It has a mean of 1.3, but you can see that this is a positively skewed variable. If you take the natural log of it, it looks like this on the left. It reels it in. So the natural log trans transformation does two things. It takes high values and sort of squishes them back, and it takes low values and stretches them out. So this is an example of a transformation where the relative distances between things are not held the same. It changes the information in the variable. Um, standardizing is a linear transformation. And this is a very common thing to do in statistics. To this, this transformation specifically is what's known as a z-score. You are taking the original variable's mean and variance and changing them to be 0 for the mean and 1 for the variance and standard deviation since standard deviation is square root of variance. Uh, the formula to do so looks like this. X, which is my uh, original variable, I, I'm using predictor here because this is the context in which this often happens. X for each person, right, sub i, remember what sub i means in the notation? It, it varies across individuals, so it is a variable. Um, minus x bar, what's that thing? Sample mean, and it doesn't have an i because it's a constant. The sample has one mean. Likewise, s on the bottom, what's that? Standard deviation, again, no i because that is a constant with respect to the sample. So if you put your original x column into this equation and make a new column, all software will do this for you, or it's pretty straightforward to do this um, arithmetically by hand, then what comes out is, has a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. But it's still a linear transformation. So if you just look at the shapes of these histograms, um, they are bunched a little bit differently because of the width of these intervals but it hasn't changed the variable. It's a linear transformation. The relative distances are still the same. The reason that people do this is to be able to take variables, usually predictors, that are on different scales and make their effects comparable. So if you change the scale so that one unit means the same thing across, that turns out to be very convenient in order to say which variable is relatively more important in predicting something else. So for instance, if we had this blue variable right here has a mean of three and a standard deviation of one, the red one here has a mean of seven and a standard deviation of three. If you did the same transformation to z-scores to both of them, they both look like that. And now two different numeric scales are on the same, on the, on the same scale, and that's then it's helpful to know what a score means. Because it turns out that this type of idea shows up very frequently in sampling distributions. So we looked at this picture last time. Do you recognize that picture? It's a, it's a normal curve. I stole it from Wikipedia, as one does. I figured out when I was prepping this class for the first time that I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. There are a million pictures on the internet of distributions and figures and so I try to attribute, whenever possible, hopefully, did I put it on this one? No, I need to add that, um, where I stole this stuff from. But this is from Wikipedia. And we looked at this picture before to make a point that in this normal distribution, which characterizes um, some continuous symmetric variables, it has two parameters, a mean and a variance. And they're separate. They're not tied together like they are in some other distributions. And so this mean and variance can change as needed to characterize whatever variable. But if you want to have a more absolute sense of what is high 
you, without having to take, to take into account what the mean and variance is, then you get something based on the same idea of a z-score, which is known as a standard normal. So this is going to be your new best friend. This thing shows up everywhere. It works out that in terms of the expected frequency of the data, that within plus or minus one standard deviation, if you have something that follows a normal distribution, will be 68% of your cases. Within two standard deviations on either side of the mean will be 95%. Two, that two is a real big deal. You see that a lot. Within three is 99%. So if my son, of course, who's going to be a stats prodigy, he has no choice given who his parents are, he, he comes home and says, Mommy, Mommy, I got a Z-score of three. I know, I don't have to ask him what that means. That means that fewer than 1% of the people in his reference preschool would have a score that high. So our task in statistics is to translate the stats that we develop off of the observed variables into something on a scale where we immediately know what it means. Whether or not it's ex with an expected variation or how infrequently you would expect something to happen. So if I told you that I had a z-score of, let's say, 0.5, well, that's, like, that's not all that uncommon. That can happen. But if I had a z-score of negative 5, yeah, way that way. Really unlikely to be that low if the mean is zero. So it has inherent meaning. Have you seen tables like this before? Eh. Guess what? We're not going to use those. I'm just showing them to you because all of this stuff is programmed in stats software. With what the right table is, um, under all circumstances, it knows. You just have to ask it for the right information. So this type of table was how I learned about these concepts back in the day. This gives you the area under the curve that corresponds to each type of z-score. So I have an example that I'm going to show you in just a second where I'm using that particular number right here that corresponds to 90%. So the z-score under which 90% of the information is to the left works out to be 1.28. So when would I do this? Here's a, here's a, a, a simple example, I would say. Um, it's not based in the real world. Let's say that I have a test score where test grades are, have a mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. And I'm going to say that they're normally distributed. If I decide that I want to give an A to only 10% of my students, where's my cutoff? I have to work backwards to figure out what is the point on the distribution where 90% is separated from 10% to be able to do that. So if you use the z-score formula, go back to where it is, the variable minus the variable's mean divided by the variable's standard deviation, you can figure out that a z-score of 1.28 corresponds to where the 90%, 10% mark would be. I can then invert that z-score formula to figure out what the original variable should be that, met, that goes with that z-score. So it's like this, the mean plus the z-value that you just found times the standard deviation, and it works out to be 119.2. So after it, the 119 is where we would expect 90% of the people taking this test to be below that, and only 10% to be above that. And that's my arbitrary cut point for an A in my example. Now note the asterisk. Am I ever going to do this in life? No. You get an A if you, if you master 90% of the material as evidenced in class. I hope all of you get A's. In fact, I give out A pluses, and I hope all of you get those too. So when would you use something like this if it's not for a toy information? How about in a research publication? I have an example of a paper that just came out a few years ago where I actually had to do this. So here is an extension of using this type of distribution idea to try to capture the range of expected variability around some number. So we have uh, the standard error of the mean, right? So that is standard deviation divided by the square root of sample size. Um, this is one of the things I changed. If you use the sample size, standard deviation from the sample, 
Typically, they switch to n minus one. It doesn't really matter until you have, uh, in, unless you have really, really small samples. But if you do the software, that's what ends up happening. So if I want to go back to, yeah, come back, oh, exit, there we go. If I want to go back to this example and try to characterize what is the information that is expected, the, vari the variability of the sample mean that's expected based on this information, this is how I would do it. I have to figure out a way to calculate what's known as a confidence interval. It's a range that says, defines what is expected relative to unexpected, where this is the idea of where you draw the line. These are different percentiles. So I could decide that I want to characterize a range in which 68% of the time I would find something, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, and so you make that choice. It's typically 95% in stats, but uh, you can often see 90 or 99 for other ones. And you pick a distribution that gives you those, per those percentiles. So the only one that we've seen so far is standard normal, so we can use that one. Okay. So we're actually going to have four different distributions that we will refer to in this class and in life to decide what is expected versus unexpected. The one you know so far is Z. You're also going to see T, chi-square, and F. We'll get to those eventually. So let's choose Z. The next question is, do we care about expected versus unexpected in both directions? Going back to the picture for a moment. Would I want to know if the amount of, of uh, ounces in my can is expected to be just too high or just too low, or both? Both. Both, both. yes, correct. Uh, both corresponds to the idea of a two-tailed test, meaning that way unexpected high and way unexpected low are both meaningful, and you want to characterize both of them. If you only cared about one or the other, that's what's known as a one-tailed, and you'd have to say which one. Um, I actually got into a Facebook debate as someone posted asking for stats advice whether they should use one-tailed or two-tailed, and I was like, it's two-tailed always. And someone's like, nah, 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 nah. And no, because it doesn't make sense in almost every application to say that one or the other doesn't matter. Let's say that you're trying to cure cancer. You're in charge of a clinical trial on a new drug. You want to know if your new drug works better than the old drug. Do you care about knowing that it's worse, too? As another alternative, you should, right? If you found out that your drug was worse, right, way over like z-score minus 5 land here, you can't just say it's not different. You have to acknowledge worse. So there are very few cases in which a one-tailed test makes sense. Um, the only one that comes to mind is if you're interested in testing whether or not a variance is above zero. Right? We just went over this. The smallest number that a standard deviation or a variance can be, zero. So if variance can't go negative, then you can't have a chance of finding the other tail. You can only find the top. So only in situations like that, I would say, is a one-tail test reasonable. Yes, sir? If that's the case, then it can't go negative? Would it can't. You, what's that? It can't, correct. It, yeah, so if that's the case, would it give you an error if you tried a two-tailed test, or could you just go ahead and always try a two-tailed test, and it just won't give you anything if it... Oh, it'll give, give you, you whatever you ask it for, whether it makes sense or not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, you need to be more aware. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's up to you to know what is reasonable to ask. It is happy to do whatever you tell it to. All programs have that limitation. Um, another real-life example of one-tailed versus two-tailed test is whether or not you allow slop in playing pool. So I am not a great pool player. Um, my view is that if I get a ball in a hole, that counts. Even if it wasn't the one that I was aiming for, right, it went in, that counts. Um, that is what's known as playing slop, from what I understand. Um, an alternative view would be it doesn't count unless it goes in the hole you meant it to, and you call that out in advance. That's a one-tail test. 
Playing slop is like a nine tail test, right? How many pockets are there? Oh, six, right? If you're willing to accept any hole, then that's the equivalent of the two tail test here. You're willing to take the result no matter what happens. Okay, back to the story. So we want to use standard normal because that's all we know. We want to look at extremeness in both directions. So let's figure out how we would know if a given mean is suspiciously different than what the population mean is supposed to be. How confident do we want to be? Where do we want to draw the line for what is expected versus unexpected? That's what's known as a confident limit or confidence interval. You will see CI or CL as an abbreviation across different software packages and in results sections. So if you want to be 90% confident, you would pick the z-score that corresponds to those boundaries. It works out to be 1.65. If you want to be 95% confident, so that you're saying that anything within 95% is expected and only 5% is unexpected, your cutoff is 1.96. If you want to be even more certain, like you really hesitate to say unexpected, that's a 99% confidence interval and you use that. Um, this is another thing that's real easy to screw up, what this actually means. The definition is that it's the interval in which the true population parameter is expected to fall, such as the, uh, the goal of 12 ounces of my can here, 95% of the time if we redid the same study over and over and over and over. That's what it means. It's not a statement of probability or anything like that. It's the range of expected. The range of expected. And so here is a picture showing uh, how this corresponds to how people talk about this. Uh, the opposite of a confidence interval is like an unconfidence interval, right? That's where we get an alternative way of saying the same idea from the opposite perspective, which is a p-value. It's the probability of the result that you got if the null, if not, I haven't talked about that word yet, if the true population parameter of what you're saying is right. And so the range in these sorts of pictures where unexpected is, that's what's known as alpha. Mm. So you can either say, like if you have a 90% 90, 90 confidence interval, that that means that you have 90% confidence, 10% unconfidence. Is that a word? Incompetence? Unconfidence? It is now. 10% <laughs> unconfidence. You have 10% alpha, 90% confidence. So you only need to say one or the other. And where did you say the alpha was? Uh, alpha is the area of the um, unexpected. So it's, if it's two tails, it's the, that section. And the question is, where do you draw the line between what is expected versus unexpected? So here is a table from a recent publication, some of my colleagues at the University of Kansas. Um, by the way, if you look at, side note here, my CV, the most popular journal that I've published in is the Journal of Speech Language Hearing Research. Can you believe that? Do you know why? Because I do statistics and data analyses for people who do speech language hearing research. Um, one of the side benefits of learning this stuff is that if you can find researchers who aren't that skilled in quantitative methods, who need help with their papers, you can help do analyses, and you can help write results sections, and you can get authorship. That is probably two-thirds of the papers on my CV, and that is the only way that I had authorship coming out of grad school, is to be able to have that skill set. So I actually, as a graduate research assistant, started, I'm going to say, collaborating with Dr. Rice, um, and we're still working together now. And so this is the latest in a series of papers. What she's interested in is uh, specific language impairment. And that's the idea that certain individuals have difficulty grasping, learning, and using the rules of grammar, even though they have no other intellectual disability. It's just like a specific thing that is harder for them than other people for who knows why. And within the, the last decade or so, her research has looked at sort of the genetic origins of this, what are the causes, um, and she's interested in twins as a way of trying to piece apart how much is genetics versus environment versus that kind of stuff. Um, it turns out that twins 
have developmental delays in a lot of areas, language being one of them. They do catch up, from what I understand, by the time they're maybe six, but they start out lower. And so she has a very large sample of twins, and the research question that this table is answering <coughs> is, is there evidence for a twinning effect? Is this sample of twins significantly off from what we expect the population mean to be on all these standardized tests. So the measure that we're looking at here, which is what's known as a phenotype, meaning the behavioral outcome that we're looking for genetic influences on, is PPVT3 vocabulary. It's a measure of uh, receptive vocabulary in, uh, no, productive vocabulary, excuse me, in children. And we have the, the means for two ages, either the same kids measured over time, four and six, whether they are monozygotic or dizygotic twins, there's the sample sizes. Here are the means. Here are the standard errors. So I'm going to highlight this last result here. The mean is 100.28, and the standard error is 0.8. Now just that, those two numbers right there, what did those tell me? What is point 0.8 in relation to this 100? You're 80% sure that the population will fall or will have a... Uh, it's, it's not a percentage. No, it's a standard error. What's a standard error? A variance of what from what? Let's go back to Mountain Dew Land. Yeah. It's this thing. That's the one where you're like... Based on what you know about the 12-pack, mm -hmm. you're making an inference about all the 12, all the 12 packs, packs, yes. So standard error is how far off, on average, the sample mean is from the population mean. So it doesn't describe the population well? Because the, if, you, if she redid the same study over and over again, she got the same sample of this types of twins, that mean of 100.28 would vary from the population mean on average by 0.8. So the fact that she has such a huge sample size makes it a really precise estimate. Like this scale is mean 100, standard deviation 15. And the average offness of any sample mean from the population mean that's 100 that it's supposed to be is only 0.8. So the question, sure. The, which part? <laughs> All of it? Okay, let me uh, reload here. Uh, I'm translating from the Mountain Dew example. So, so the definition of standard error is how far off on average any one sample mean is from the population mean. The fact that we're making that statement based on only one sample is like the belief structure that we're using. Right. You just got to believe. <laughs> so in this example, this mean of 100.28, this is what we got in the data. This is a standardized test that's supposed to have a mean of 100. So that's our reference point. Point 0.8 is how far off, on average, a mean of any given sample would be from the population mean of 100. Uh, I think where I'm going to start is point 0.8 of what? Point 0.8 of this scale. Okay. And that actually makes a good point, because it's like, what do these numbers mean? Like, what's big, what's a lot? Well, I can tell you that on a scale that ranges from um, 100 to standard deviation of 15 would mean that 95% of the time the students who take this test would be between uh, 70 and 130, like the individual scores. That's what a standard deviation of 15 would mean. With a, a test that ranges that much, having the mean be off by only 0.8, like that's a tiny amount. Like this is a pretty precise estimate. And that's because she has 372 twins contributing to it. Now the question is, is this expected or unexpected? It's not exactly 100. It's pretty close. <coughs> but we don't want to just wave our hands and be like, it looks close to me. There is an actual empirical way to say whether or not it's close. So within uh, this example here, the next column's over. These give the boundaries of what is expected versus unexpected. 
it is a 95% confidence interval. So it works out that two standard errors, roughly it's 1.96 to be precise, times the standard error, that gives you the interval. So the middle is what you got. The lower end is roughly two standard errors. The upper end is roughly two standard errors the other way. So if we redid this study over and over and over and over again, this average offness of 0.8 of the sample mean from the population mean translates into an expected range of sample means from 98.7 to 101.8. That's the expected range of variability given this one sample of all the samples. Now, where is 100 relative to this interval? It's inside it, right? Comfortably inside it. So the conclusion would be, yeah, it looks like this is not different than 100 because 100 is well within the range of expected that's given to us based on this sample mean and this sample standard error. This case is interesting because um, these first two are evidence of not a twinning effect. It's the wrong way. The mean is actually a little higher than what it's supposed to be, whereas the first two at age four, the mean is lower than it's supposed to be. So at age four, it looks like the twins, on average, are lower than where they're supposed to be given the standardized test. And that's what this last column is trying to indicate, is to whether or not the sample mean is included. And I have a minus sign here to indicate no, because the interval is lower than the 100 is supposed to be. Lower. The interval in this case is actually higher. So we would say that in the first two cases, yeah, these numbers are well into unexpected territory. If the, if the mean is really 100, you would not find that. You would not find these numbers very often. Uh, you would find the mean, uh, excuse me, these numbers to be very often if the mean were truly 100 and the one you got from your sample is 100.28. So there's a couple different things going on here. So this is, um, like I said, a publication that actually is using this stuff. Yes, sir. The 100 that we're talking about that doesn't fit in the first mm -hmm. three of them. Correct. Is that the part that, we're, that you were saying, like, you just have to believe that that number is right? Yeah. Okay. So that's, my, that's my reference point. Okay. So much like... So like, if I was doing my own stuff on Mountain Dew, mm -hmm. how do I know what number that 100 would be? For that study? Because the can says it has 12 ounces. Okay, so that would be our reference number. <laughs> the reference number, the yes. Number. I'm going to call this a null hypothesis in a few minutes, and I'm trying really hard not to say that phrase word. But okay. if you've heard that term, that's what I'm saying. Okay. It's your baseline. Yes, in question. In this case, is the 100 based on the standardized test that was given? Yes, because in the manual it says the population average is 100, and it gives you percentiles for what it should be if you're in the 30th percentile, 50th percentile, da 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 da. Yeah. Um, interestingly, on some types of foods and beverages, you see the word like approximately three servings, mm. right? They're hedging their bets. It's this idea that they have some expected range that they're willing to admit to, approximately. Yes. So the first two values are lower than what they're supposed to be. The third one is higher, and the fourth one looks like where it's supposed to be is, is a reasonable thing. Yeah? You keep saying they're lower or higher than this is supposed to be, but I'm not understanding that part. Okay. Um, so each of these numbers is supposed to be 100 if the sample is typical. What the, the research question is, is there a developmental delay specific to being a twin? So this is a sample of entirely twins. And this is one of the first times that standardized tests were given to a sample of twins, which is why it was a big deal. And at age four, there is evidence of developmental delay. Across the board, the average of these twins is lower than what it's supposed to have been, which is 100. Now the question is, is it lower like, like it's a, within a reasonable like variability, or is it lower like, no, this is no worth? And where we're headed is trying to get an exact probability of finding that number if 100 were really truly the case. 
What we know right now is that 100 is not in this interval. 100 is outside the interval. So this is unexpected relative to 100. Yes, unexpected is, is sort of the key idea here. 100 is supposed to be truth. The first two rows are unexpected if 100 is truth. The third row is unexpected in the other way. So this is the, the two-tailed versus one-tailed test, right? We're willing to say unexpected in either direction is noteworthy. And in the last row, it's expected. 100 is in the interval. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Other questions or clarifications? What time is it? Yeah. Um, for, the, um, for the standard, when it was at 100, um, what was the, the upper for like the for when they weren't twins? Like, what was the, the upper limit? Um, the this particular scale is norm to have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So if we go back to this picture for a moment, that means that if you go plus or minus one standard deviation, so that would be 85 up to 115, 68% of the kids should fall in that interval. If you go all the way down to two standard deviations below, so that would be 70, two fifteenths, and one thirty, then that is 95% of the kids would fall in that. So there is, it, I don't know what the top score on the test is because it depends on the version. It's somewhere around 200 in the raw score. And then that gets converted to expected score based on the child's age and, and some other stuff. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just trying to see like how far off Ah, so this table doesn't directly give you that information. Go this. Because what's reported is summaries of the individuals, the mean and standard error of the mean. What's not reported is the standard deviation of the sample. Now, could I get that? Yeah, because standard deviation and sample size give you standard error. So I could work backwards and get standard deviation from standard error and sample size. I could do that. So in terms of being more specific, how likely is this pattern of results if the mean were truly 100? Welcome to your first hypothesis test, as it's known, way of answering a question. We're going to convert these numbers into a new scale, a z-score scale, so that I don't have to try and guess how much 0.8 is relative to 100. So it's the sample mean minus the population mean that it's supposed to be. So this is what comes from previous literature, what it says on the can, what it says in the testing manual, etc divided by the standard error for our sample. If we do that, we've effectively rescaled these two numbers onto that picture. The picture that I keep flipping back to. This sample mean and this sample standard error relative to the population mean of 100 works out to be a z-score of 0.35. So where is that on the picture? 0.35, right here. So not that far off, right? Well within expected by almost any definition. More specifically, the p-value that corresponds to that new z, the probability of getting a sample mean of 100.28, if the real mean was 100, works out to be uh, 72%. That's if we accept unexpected in both directions. That's two-tailed. That's what you'll hear me say the whole time. If you wanted it in one tail, you take that number and divide it in half. So 72% of the time, we would see a value this extreme 
meaning it's not that extreme. Well within expected variation. Now, where did I get those p-values? Um, I asked the Google for a z to p-value converter and it spit it out. How are you going to get them? Software. Here's another one. Let's look at the result from line three here. A mean of 101.93. Now, is that a little high, like expected high, or is that really anomalous? Well, put it in the formula. 101.93 minus 100 divided by the standard error of 0.45 gives us a z-score of 4.3. So four standard deviations away from the mean. That's aberrant. So the p-value that corresponds to this would be 0 0.0018. That's how often you would see a sample mean that extreme if the true mean were 100. So it's well within unexpected territory. Really unlikely. Okay. How are we doing? So when does this class get over? I don't want to run over. I did that all the time last semester. I'm not going to do it again. 145. We got plenty of time left. Do you want to hear a story about beer? Sure. <laughs> I'm told beer fixes everything. I personally believe that wine does instead, but I don't have a story about wine. <laughs> So this is a true story. It is about somebody who worked in a beer factory, Guinness to be specific. Uh, this is back in 1899, where Guinness was tasked with quality control for, I want to say, uh, hops or something. He had some sort of test as to how much of a particular uh, thing could be in the beer. And because we're dealing with plants that take time to grow, um, he didn't have a whole lot of data. He had three to four batches of beer that he would test in a sample. And his job was to figure out that he took a measurement, and was that measurement uh, the same as what it's supposed to be? So it's exactly like this, right? He took a measure of some quantity in beer. He had a target number it was supposed to be. And his job was to, to uh, designate which of the samples looked like they didn't have enough or had too much. And so he was doing this. And he turned out to have a uh, second test that was then done that cost more money and more time. And that's, he sent all these samples that were deemed problematic, that they had a mean that was unexpected relative to what it was supposed to be, to this extra test. And it turned out that more times than not, the samples were actually okay. He was being way too lenient. He was flagging too many things as problematic. And he wanted to figure out why. So in an unexpected twist, he decided to go to graduate school, get a degree in statistics that the company paid for. They let him do this so that he could figure out what was up. And it turns out that that shape that I keep showing you, the Z, that doesn't work for small samples. It works just fine if you have 700 kids, but if you have like four batches of beer you're testing, that shape doesn't hold. So he derived computationally with like note cards and stuff, a new distribution. And he wanted to publish this result, but there was a rule at Guinness that you could not publish because they were worried about you spilling company secrets. And they agreed to let him publish under a pseudonym, which was student. Hmm. And that is where students T was born. So thanks to beer, we had better tests. So he derived this distribution instead. So the same idea. It's a way of taking numbers that are on sort of a weird scale, an unfamiliar scale in terms of describing a sample mean in this case and a sample mean standard error, and converting them into a scale that tells us readily how unexpected that result is relative to some ex ex expected population norm. So this distribution gets wider and flatter the fewer people you have. So if you want to maintain the same predicted area, so let's say that you want to have 95% as your expected versus unexpected border, you have to go further out into the tail to, get, to maintain that same area. 
So for instance, if you have the blue line here, if you have six cases, the value that goes into the formula for your confidence interval, let me back up to this right here, that number, that number 1.96 needs to be bigger. If you have six people, that number needs to be 2.45. If you only have three people, it needs to be 3.18. So it's this flatter distribution. There's more, uh, you have to go further out to hit the same level of percentile in terms of what is expected versus unexpected. Um, I have a star here that says the T distribution is always what we're going to use. So say bye bye to Z. You will rarely see it again. The reason is that if you have about somewhere around 30 is where it stops mattering, but if you have an infinite sample size, then the value for the T and the value for the Z are the same to where they designate expected versus unexpected. So T becomes Z if you have enough people. If you don't have enough people, then you have T. So when you are looking at software, you will see these letters head a column of results, a T value or a Z value. And that tells you your location in this distribution, how unexpected you are. And do I expect you to use or memorize any of these tables? No. no. Software does it. Always. Okay. So this term here, this DF equals, I mentioned this before, but I wanted to come back to it here. Um, it's a term called degrees of freedom. It's the idea of how many points did we have to spend to be able to characterize our variable. In this case, it's denominator degrees of freedom. It's number of sa it's sample size minus the number of things you've had to spend so far. So far, we've only spent the mean. So in these tables, it says degrees of freedom. That's because it matters not only how many people you have, but also how many points you spent to be able to characterize your outcome variable. So at a, a simple level, let's say that I have one mean because I'm pretending that my sample is homogenous. If I wanted to estimate two different means for two different groups of people, then can you guess what this would become? Not n minus one, but n minus two. And if I have three means, n minus three. So it's, it's how many things are you having to calculate to be able to figure this out? And calculate meaning have the software do it for you. So there's a real world analogy to this. Um, it's most recently instantiated in Weight Watchers and their points system, which is why I keep saying points, but it actually goes all the way back to the 80s. I don't think I have enough bandwidth here, but if you're curious, here's a clip from a, uh, a thing called deal a meal. Anyone old enough to know what deal a meal is? Yeah, she knows. She's laughing over there. It's Richard Simmons' dieting program. Oh. So this is an infomercial. It has some excellent 80s hair. Um, the, it's like a wallet, and you have cards in your wallet. And you start out the day with, like, 21 cards. And every time you eat, you move the corresponding card over to the other column. And when your wallet is empty, you put the fork down, and you stop eating for the day. It's the same, same as Weight Watchers points. So think of degrees of freedom like this. It's like we have so many points, and the number of points is our sample size. Because I don't have to compute a mean at all. I could compute a Lisa mean that perfectly describes me, and a Cheryl mean that perfectly describes her, and so on and so on and so on. And I could have 776 means, right? That would perfectly describe my data, and I'd spend all my points. So it's points left over. How many more things do we have room for to be able to characterize this variable? And it's denominator degrees of freedom specifically in this case what, that I'm talking about. There's also numerator degrees of freedom, which is the number of relationship-specific parameters. That one will come, will come to later. We'll get there later. Okay, so intermediate summary. All we've talked about so far is a mean. This same set of principles apply in any statistic, though, any measure of association, um, any measure of, say, variability, what this would be it. So we have now a way to answer our Mountain Dew question. 
we can make a confidence interval. The lower end of the confidence interval, say low CI is up here, and I'll type the formula. It is the mean, I'm going to run out of room here, mean minus 1.96, in this case because we're using Z because I've got the whole population here. Uh, if you want to do, uh, if I want to pay attention to my sample size and instead look up the new value, I could do that. Yeah, I don't know the T distribution off the top of my head, but it would be 12 minus 1. For P less than 0.05, it would be 2.20. So since I'm working with, uh, actually, that's the 24 pack. Let me go down further. 24 pack, here's the line 23 is 2.07. So we'll put that in there. 2.07 times what? Standard error. Let's see. The upper CI looks remarkably similar, except it's the mean plus that quantity. So if I make Excel do my math for me, squish this down a little bit. No, nope, come on. There we go equals pack mean minus 2.07 times, there's my standard error, there's that. I'm going to copy that formula. I'm just doing a demo for you, you guys are not going to have to do this. Yeah, I'm going to change the plus. There we go. There's my interval. So if I have a mean of 11.8 from my, 112, uh, my 124 pack, excuse me, how likely is it, if it's really 12, that I came up with 11.8 with instead? Well, 12 is not in here. This is suspicious. Now, the last numbers that I plugged in here are very small, a standard deviation of 0.1. I had 0.3 in here earlier. What do you think is going to happen to my interval if I plug in 0.3 instead? Yeah, I'll take gestures. Wider. Yeah. Because 0.3, I'm less certain what the sample mean is going to be in any one case. Still not. Still not, yeah. So yeah, 11.8 is suspicious. I've never actually done this experiment live, but uh, if that would, you would have cause for a claim if that were the case. Do you mean the I C I? Um, I think you. Well, yeah, copy and paste error. There we go. Yep. And if you wanted to, you could calculate a Z value that goes with these numbers. So I'll come down here. The Z value. So we're putting this mean and this standard error onto a new scale to try and figure out just how extreme it is. Z equals, it is the sample mean, so minus population mean, over sample standard error, excuse me, not SD. So if I do that, it's that one, minus 12, put parentheses here to not screw up my order of operations, divided by that number. My Z is minus three and some change. So how extreme is it? It's minus three. It's pretty extreme, yeah. So it's out down here on the left-hand side. The p-value that goes with that is less than, definitely less than 0.05. So probably even smaller than that. I don't know what it is, would be off the top of my head or what the Excel command is to get that, but I'm sure I could figure out eventually. But yeah, this is a way to put any set of numbers like this onto a scale that you know what it means. So we could talk about ounces. We could talk about um, grams. We could talk about PPVT scores, anything. This new Z-score metric has meaning. The formula for T, by the way, is exactly the same. T 
and z are the same. The difference is what is the reference distribution you compare it to to say what is expected versus unexpected. T is flatter if you have a small sample of cans like this. This. All right. So we end up with a p-value that tells us if the true mean were whatever number we say it is, how likely is it that we would find a sample mean like we got? Now we can do the same thing for other types of statistics besides the mean, like the mean of a categorical variable. For instance, the proportion of ones rather than zeros in a binary variable. Um, the trick with that is that you have to make sure that your confidence interval obeys the rules, that it has to stay between zero and one. Um, you could get a confidence interval around a variance. Um, I have a few, I think I had a few slides about that in an earlier lecture just as sort of a, oh, by the way, because that's something that hardly ever happens. Um, all software packages will happily spit this information out for you if you know how to ask. Yeah. Question about the model that you did in sample. Mm -hmm. Do you mind pulling up that Excel spreadsheet? Mm -hmm. So did you say that you are suspicious of the packing? Yes, I am. Now, why am I suspicious? Because it falls in between the low CI and the high CI. That's why I asked. Ah, it's not where the pack mean is. It has to fall between because this the what you got for your pack mean is the center of this confidence interval. The question is where does the population mean fall, and it's not in here. And that's the twelve. Mm -hmm. That's the twelve. So this number right here gives you the place where um, you would be on the distribution, go back to the picture, T distribution here. If the middle were true, like if this was 12, R11.8 would be way out here. It's well into unexpected territory, less than 0.05 for sure. Thank you. Sure. Now what if it were 12.1? What do you think is going to happen? Well, watch what happens to the interval first. 12.1 is the middle now. The interval includes 12. The t value that goes with 12.1 is 1.6. So if 0 is in the middle here, here's 1.6, well with an expected variation. If the mean is really 12, you would see 12.1 as a sample mean a decent amount of the time. No cause for alarm. What makes it more or less extreme is based on these two numbers right here. The standard deviation for your sample, the average offness of any one can to the pack mean, and the number of cans. So if it was 12.2, you would expect to see just kind of the inverse of what we already had, 11.8, right? Yep. Watch what happens to my t value here. 11.8 minus 3 point change, 12.2 plus. What would it be if the pack mean were exactly 12? What would my t value become? Zero. If it were exactly 12, I'm smack in the middle. Well within expected. The most expected, as it were. Now this is an interesting case. Look at the interval now. This would be the bounds under which you could say approximately, right? You would have in your factory at Pepsi products, some sort of expected range that you're willing to say is okay enough. So if you published this information, you said that on average, any one can is off by 0.3, then the mean of the 12 packs could be anywhere in here. 75% of the time, 95% of the time, excuse me. Question or just stretching? 
um, in the Celtic that Sue, I think last year, because um, someone said on average they put on the sandwich is very not a foot long. Ah. Mm. It, can you try to find that and send it to me? Because that would be a, another great example. But yeah, these um, these types of questions don't often come up. Usually, you're trying to explore relationships between variables. But this is a sort of quality control question. Or if reviewer three criticizes your sample because they're atypical, because of the mean that they got on a variable, and you want to say, no, that mean is a little high, but it's well within expected territory, this is the, the way that you can make that argument. Define the range of what is expected and what is the location on the distribution that your answer falls with, your sample mean. The thing that we're talking about next time, since we're not going to get there, is how this translates from just testing one variable, I mean, a descriptor for one variable, to relationships between variables. It's the same idea. Most of the time, the default assumption that people make about relationships between variables is that there is none. That's the standard. It doesn't have to be, but that's usually the standard. And so we're going to try to determine if the association that we found between two variables in our sample is expected or unexpected relative to zero association. And it turns out that you have all different kinds of ways of, of determining association. And how you know which one is the right way to do it depends on what type of variable you have. So we will do correlations between quantitative variables. We will do chi-squares between categorical variables. And situations in which you have one of one and one of the other, we're going to do in models. So that's where we're headed next time. The other thing that I'm going to show you next time is how to get your software to do all this stuff for you. Uh, we are not going to be running programs in this class ever again. The, the, uh, the debacle of trying to get everybody's running at the same time is exactly why we're not going to do that. Um, what I'm going to do is make handouts just like this one where I am copying in the syntax from each program, talking about what it means, and I have the what it does in comments here, and then pasting in the output that the program gives, as well as notes about what it, how to interpret it. So that's the type of thing that we'll go over to show you how to do these things in practice. And then you'll be able to borrow these little chunks of code to do your homework, the same as you did in with example one code to do homework one. So this will be getting a chance to practice these things. Uh, tests about means and tests about associations will become homework two in two weeks. Yay. Yes, so, sir. By doing this, we're still running it through, through SAS and STATA, mm -hmm. but we're doing that at home rather than in, in class. Yes. But those, like the printouts and stuff like that, are those just going to be examples? They're not going to be the exact same that we'll pull up, right? Uh, it will be the same type of thing. So, for instance, one of your homework two questions would be, uh, let me find something in here, about associations. I'm scrolling here. Uh, how do you test whether or not a sample mean is different from some hypothesized value? That's prop T test. So, I will show you how to use PROC T test to answer that type of question. I will give you a question asking the same concept in homework, and you will change the name of the data set and the name of the variable that refers to the question and interpret the results. Okay. I was just, I wanted to make sure it wasn't like this is the result, the same like number for number result that you're going to get. Nope. Then I'm less likely to actually run it on my own. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I give you all of the files, the original files that this handout was made from, so that if it makes you feel better, like you can generate the results on your own. Some people just like the, the feeling that that gives them, and then I want them to have that happiness. But what I want you to know how to do is to use these things in practice. And so I give you an example, but it's up to you to figure out how to generalize from that example to a new situation. 
where the first, the generalization is really just a question of making this, the syntax work by swapping the name of the data and the variable. Later on, when we get to models, it's how do I set up the model correctly to answer this question? So there's a little more gray area as we get more complicated. Okay. Other qu thoughts, questions? So we have a formal assessment meeting next Monday. Uh, next Monday, and I will, I will put that up probably on Thursday after class because I want to see how far we get and make sure I don't ask any questions we haven't talked about yet. <laughs> It'll be the same deal. Um, it's meant to be a structured review, not graded, just completed. I'll look at the answers on Tuesday morning so that I can figure out um, if there's any common points of concern or misinterpretation. Okay? Okay. It's only Tuesday, isn't it? I was about to say, have a good weekend. I'm like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Not yet. All right. Well, have a good Tuesday. How's that? And let me know if you need help with your homework still. <laughs>